Las Vegas, 1958. Two mechanics decided to test the limits of American engineering. They did not take a car to a racetrack. They took a brand new Cessna 172, painted the name Hacienda on the side, and took off. Their goal was simple, do not land, not to sleep, not to eat, and definitely not to refuel. For the next 64 days, Bob Tim and John Cook lived in a box the size of a Honda Civic, floating 1,000 feet above the Mojave Desert. They refueled by diving at a moving truck at 80 miles per hour, twice a day, every day. They battled carbon monoxide poisoning, howling storms, and the psychological torture of sleep deprivation. Their Continental O300 engine survived everything else. Most planes need an overhaul after 2,000 hours. This one stayed airborne for 1,558 hours. Why did it not seize, overheat, or explode? How did the men keep from killing each other? This is the story of an industrial miracle, the greatest endurance flight in history. The Cessna 172 is not a machine built for records. It is a four-seat trainer, simple and honest, with just enough fuel to get a family across a state line. But Bob Tim and John Cook needed more than that. They needed a way to keep the engine running, not for a few hours, but for months. The answer was a metal belly tank, bolted right under the fuselage where the slipstream is loudest and the ground feels closest. That tank turned the airplane into something new, an aerial fuel depot, heavy and awkward, with its balance shifted forward like a loaded wheelbarrow. Every gallon added to the belly tank pulled the center of gravity away from the wings and toward the nose. The Cessna's yoke, normally feather-light, became a stubborn lever. The pilots had to fight the trim every hour, every minute. If they let go even for a second, the nose would dip and the horizon would tilt. Flying straight and level became a test of discipline, not just skill. Weight distribution charts pinned to the cockpit wall told the story in numbers. Full main tanks, full belly tank, two men, one stripped down seat, a pile of canned food. Each refuel meant recalculating the trim, rebalancing the load, and adjusting for the shifting mass below their feet. The auxiliary tank did not just add range, it added workload. It demanded constant attention, especially as the fuel level dropped and the center of gravity crept back toward normal, then shifted again after every transfer. The metalwork was rough but effective. Welds ran the length of the tank, and fuel lines snaked up into the airframe. A set of switches and valves let the pilots choose which tank fed the engine at any moment. There was no room for error. A missed switch or a stuck valve could mean a dead engine, a forced landing, and the end of the record attempt. With the belly tank in place, the Cessna could stay aloft for days at a time, if the pilots managed the balance and if the next refuel came before the needles dipped too low. The airplane was no longer just a machine, it was an equation solved and solved again in real time with every pound of fuel and every twitch of the yoke. Friction kills engines. Oil is the only thing standing between moving metal and a seized up disaster. On the ground, changing oil is routine. Land, drain, refill, check for metal shavings and hope for the best. In the air, for 64 days straight, there is no such luxury. Bob Tim knew this from the start. He designed a system that let him swap out the lifeblood of the Continental O300 without ever shutting down the prop. Precision was the watchword, but the work was nerve-wracking. A closed-loop pump circuit, hard plumbed into the engine sump, stood ready under the cowling. When the time came, Tim would reach for a row of valves bolted to the firewall. Old oil was drawn out, quart by quart, into a waiting reservoir. Fresh oil followed, pumped in by hand, every gallon counted. Each step had to be precise, isolate the right lines, open the right taps, watch the pressure gauge like a hawk. A slip in the sequence, air in the system, a stuck valve, a missed pressure drop, meant instant engine damage, maybe worse. No one had ever tried this in flight for so long. The O300 held about 8 quarts, and every drop had to be replaced on the fly, 
with the engine humming along at cruise. The cockpit filled with the smell of hot oil and the faint whir of the pump. Tim's hands worked methodically. Valve, pump, check, repeat. He logged every cycle in a notebook wedged between the seat rails. This was not a job for a distracted pilot. Losing focus meant risking the only thing keeping them aloft. Oil changes were timed to coincide with refueling runs, when the plane was already flying low and slow over the desert highway. It was a routine built on discipline, drain, refill, pressure check, then back to the endless circuit above the Mojave. The closed loop rig kept the bearings slick and the pistons cool, fighting the silent enemy of wear. This was not just maintenance, it was survival. For 1,558 hours, the engine stayed alive because Tim refused to let friction win. Matching speeds at 80 miles per hour sounds simple on paper. In the air, it is a knife-edge calculation. The Cessna 1772 descends toward the desert highway, wheels just above the asphalt, searching for the battered Ford truck keeping pace below. The margin for error was measured in single digits. A drift of more than three miles per hour and the hose would whip away, or worse, snap tight and rip from the truck's grip. The truck's speedometer bounced, the plane's airspeed needle jittered, but both crews had to lock in, side by side, for three long minutes. The hose itself was a lifeline, coiled and heavy, waiting for the right moment. The man in the truck would lean out, arms straining against the wind, and raise the nozzle like a relay baton. Above, the pilot had to hold altitude within feet, fighting the updrafts and turbulence kicked up by the highway. The hook under the Cessna's belly had to snag the hose on the first pass, miss, and the whole operation reset. Fuel wasted, nerves frayed, another circuit over the Mojave. Once the connection was made, the real test began. Both vehicles, separated by less than 20 feet, had to maintain perfect formation. The truck driver watched the horizon, knuckles white on the wheel. The pilot matched every swerve, every bump in the asphalt, adjusting throttle and rudder with the delicacy of a surgeon. Crosswinds could tilt the plane, a gust could push it sideways, and every correction risked breaking the fragile link. There was no autopilot, no computer to smooth out the variables. It was all human muscle, sweat, and instinct. The transfer window was brutally tight. At 80 miles per hour, even a two seconds lag meant the hose could miss, fuel could spill, or the plane could outpace the truck entirely. The pilots had to read each other's movements through the vibration of the controls and the pitch of the engine. The choreography was relentless, a line, hook, pump, and release, repeated 128 times over two months. Every successful refuel was a small victory over physics, a handshake between man and machine at the edge of what was possible. It was not just about keeping the tanks full, it was about mastering the rhythm, knowing that a single miscalculation could end it all in a flash of flame and twisted metal. The refueling run became a ritual, a high-speed dance where precision was survival and error was not an option. Every 12 hours, the ritual began again. The Cessna would circle down over the desert highway, altitude dropping, nerves tightening. Below, the refueling truck rumbled into position, its engine straining to keep pace. The routine was strict, align, descend, signal, hook, pump, release. There was no room for improvisation. With 128 hookups ahead of them, the men became creatures of habit, moving through each step as if rehearsing a drill they could never afford to forget. Each run started with a set of gestures, quick flashes of the hand, a tilt of the wing, a nod from the truck crew. These silent codes replaced words, because even the radio chatter grew stale and thin. The checklist became a chant, muttered under breath, fuel valve, trim, pressure, pump. Miss one word, skip one movement, and the whole chain could break. The pilots traded off, one flying, one watching the clock, waiting for the next cycle to begin. The monotony was its own kind of torture. The desert never changed, the truck never changed. The sound of the engine, the slap of the wind, the rattle of the yoke, each detail repeated itself until it was impossible to tell one day from another. The logbook filled with identical entries, time, gallons transferred, weather, crew initials. 
Even the danger faded into background noise. The men learned to ignore the risk, just as they ignored the ache in their hands and the stiffness in their backs. But the routine wore them down. Sleep came in broken pieces, snatched between refueling runs, always interrupted by the next checklist or the next burst of static from the radio. The cockpit shrank with each passing day, the walls closing in as the schedule ground on. The only way out was forward, through the next hookup, the next 12 hours, the next line in the log. Precision kept the engine alive, but it also trapped the men in a loop they could not escape. By the 30th, the 40th, the 100th hookup, the refueling run was no longer a feat of daring. It was a clockwork sentence. Each repetition etched a little more fatigue into the faces of Tim and Cook and a little more strain into the metal heart of the Continental O300. The race was no longer against the desert or the odds. It was against exhaustion and against the slow, grinding wear that routine brings to both man and machine. Carbon deposits are the silent killers of piston engines. In a normal flight, a Cessna 172 spends most of its time cruising at comfortable power, burning clean and running smooth. But stretch that routine to weeks and the chemistry changes. Every hour at low throttle, half-burned fuel leaves a trace, black soot on the spark plugs, crust building on the piston crowns. The air-cooled Continental O300 was never meant for this kind of punishment. Carbon sneaks in, coats the inside, and waits for a chance to choke the engine. Tim and Cook knew the risk. Let the carbon build up and the engine would start to cough and stumble. So they fought back with bursts of violence. Once or twice a day, the man at the controls would jam the throttle forward until the prop screamed. Cylinder head temperatures soared. The noise filled the cockpit, bouncing off the plexiglass and rattling every loose bolt. For a few minutes, nothing else mattered, just the engine roaring at full power, burning away the carbon and blowing the black crust out the exhaust. The price was steep. The off-duty pilot, trying to grab a few minutes of sleep on the stripped-out seat, would jolt awake as the engine hit redline. The vibration drilled into bone. It was impossible to rest with the O300 howling feet from your head. Over time, even the anticipation became torture. Every blowout run meant another hour lost to sleep, another layer of fatigue. The cockpit shrank with every cycle, the noise eating away at nerves already frayed by confinement and routine. But there was no other choice. Plug fouling was a constant threat. After each blowout, the pilots would check the plugs for black residue, scraping off what they could and hoping the next run would buy them another day. The logbook filled with notes, RPM, oil pressure, plug checks, carbon count. The rhythm was relentless. Cruise, blowout, inspect, repeat. Microsleep hovered at the edge of every shift. The difference between rest and disaster was measured in seconds. Fall asleep at the yoke, and the Cessna would drift or drop. Ignore the carbon and the engine would die. The men traded off, each forced to choose between sleep and vigilance, sanity and survival. The O300 demanded constant attention, its needs as real and exhausting as either pilot's own. In the end, the engine's endurance was paid for in lost hours, ringing ears, and the slow erosion of will. Day 39th. The cockpit was already a pressure cooker, full of noise, heat, and stale air. That night, the light snapped out. The generator quit without warning, and the instrument panel faded to black. With no radio, no cabin heat, and nothing but the moon and the distant glow of Las Vegas, the Cessna became a shadow over the desert. The only thing left alive was the engine, droning in the dark. Bob Tim was on duty. He reached for the flashlight, but the batteries had faded days ago. The only way to check the compass was to catch the glint of passing headlights on the highway far below. The temperature dropped, breath fogged in the cramped cabin. The off-duty pilot pulled his jacket tighter and tried to sleep, but the cold gnawed through every layer. The hum of the O300 was steady, but the silence from the instruments made every second feel like a countdown. Then came the headache. Dull at first, then sharp behind the eyes. The air in the cockpit felt heavy and metallic. 
Tim shook Cook awake, and both men realized something was wrong. The exhaust system, battered by weeks of vibration, had sprung a leak. Carbon monoxide was seeping into the cabin, invisible and deadly. Dizziness set in. Fingers fumbled with the side window. Fresh air rushed in, biting cold but clean. They forced themselves to breathe deep, fighting off the haze. It was a near miss. One more hour and the engine might have outlasted the crew. Neither man spoke for a while. The only sound was the engine, still running, still demanding attention. In the darkness, with death brushing past their shoulders, they weighed their options. The previous record was already in the rearview mirror. They could land, claim victory, and let someone else try to top it. Or they could keep flying, push the machine and themselves until the numbers were out of reach for good. Tim checked the logbook by the weak light of a match. He looked at Cook. The answer was obvious. They would not land, not yet. The O300 had survived everything thrown at it. Carbon, heat, friction, now even a brush with poison. If the engine could keep going, so could they. The cockpit stayed dark, but the decision was clear. They would make the record unbreakable. Today, almost every piston aircraft engine is replaced or overhauled long before reaching 1,500 hours. The Hacienda Cessna's feat stands as a challenge modern engineering cannot or will not repeat. As aviation moves toward automation and disposability, true mechanical endurance becomes rare. In a world chasing the next upgrade, this engine's survival reminds us what is possible when durability outlasts every expectation. Would you trust your life to a machine that's stubborn?